Okay, um, we'll go ahead and get started. This meeting is, or this webinar, <laughs> is being recorded, so you'll be able to access it afterwards along with the slides. We'll make sure you send those out to everybody. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please interrupt me. <laughs> uh, feel free to unmute yourself or drop um, a question or comment in the chat. Um, I want this to be interactive, so um, please do ask us all of, the, all of your questions or comments. We're happy to answer those. Um, and to introduce myself, my name is Dana Catron. I'm the Director of Strategic Operations here at Arrowhead Center. And then I'm also the Program Director for our SBIR um, Assistance Program and MFAST. And today we'll be talking about a pretty high level overview of the SBIR and STTR program. So if you're new to the programs, um, or interested in them, this will this will give you a, a pretty good idea of whether um, they are something you'd like to pursue in terms of funding for your business. Or if you're advising other people, it should give you a pretty good overview of um, how these programs work. And then Stephanie Garcia, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Stephanie, she's also on this webinar. She can answer any um, technical questions, things like that too. And she'll be fielding any chat questions to me as well. But Stephanie, do you want to introduce yourself since you're on our team? Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Stephanie Garcia. I'm a program uh, specialist with um, NMFAST. I'm happy to be here. If you guys have any questions that you drop in the chat and Dana doesn't see them, I'll make sure that we get those asked. Great. Thanks, Steph. All right. So to jump right in. Oops, let me make sure. Okay. So the purpose of this webinar, again, is to provide you with a really high-level overview of these programs. Um, they're they're the best source of non-dilutive capital for early stage technologies and innovations. And so we're I'm always really excited to talk about them and to promote them um, to businesses throughout the state and the country. Um, so today we'll we'll talk to you about the SBIR and SDTR programs, how they work, what that process looks like, the agencies that participate, things like that. And then we'll also talk to you a little bit about our New Mexico FAST program here at Arrowhead Center and how we can help you if you are interested in um, putting together a proposal for one of these funding opportunities. So to go into the programs, SBIR and STTR stand for Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer. Um, they are two very similar programs. We'll get a little bit into um, the, the differences between the two, but really they, they were designed to support scientific excellence and technological innovation um, by injecting federal research funds into small businesses so that they could develop um, technologies and innovations. Um, there are five goals that are tied to both of these programs. Um, one through four are specifically for both programs, and then five is more specific to just STTR. But the first is to meet the federal R&D needs by providing those research dollars um, directly to small businesses. The second is to increase private sector commercialization of these innovations derived from federal R&D funding. The third, they're really interested in stimulating technological innovation. And so, um, you know, the government realizes that one of the biggest gaps and hurdles for small businesses and for, you know, really early stage technologies is getting the funding um, to explore if those innovations are even commercializable, if they're going to work, things like that. And so that's where the, these funds really um, play a key role. Number four is to foster and encourage participation in innovation and entrepreneurship by socially and economically disadvantaged persons. And so you'll see later, um, we, we stress a lot on serving underserved um, populations and communities. We really do a lot of outreach in rural communities in New Mexico, um, things like that. And we, we really want to um, make these programs available to everybody. And that includes first time applicants because they can be pretty intimidating the first time you, you look at one of those um, solicitations. And then fifth is to foster technology transfer through cooperative R&D between, again, those small businesses and research institutions. Um, and again, this is specific to STTR and we'll talk about why in a minute here. But again, these are the five kind of overarching goals for these, um, these two programs and they're really what drive um, the funding that, that goes into them. 
There we go. So one of the, the really key things to think about if you're interested in, in these programs is the technical challenge focus. This is really important. Um, the agencies really want you or the business to solve a technical challenge with your innovation. So you have to really ask yourself, what, what challenge are you solving? What gap is is it that you're addressing? Um, the phrase, if I can already go out and buy it, I'll do just that. If, if that's the case, this funding probably isn't for you. They're, they're looking for new um, and innovative products and technologies and, and processes to fund. So there also needs to be a really compelling reason why this funding is the only path forward. This is usually pretty easy. <laughs> um, usually you're, it's, it's so early stage that you can't get any other funding other than maybe debt or debt financing, which um, you know, small businesses don't always want to incur a lot of debt to prove out a technology. So this is, um, again, where those programs fit. They're, they're there to fund that early stage technology. So you don't have to go into to debt. And um, again, usually the SBIR and STTR programs are funding a business far, far before you'll um, be eligible for angel investment, venture capital, things like that too. So um, that's something to think about as well. And then it forms a background for growth. So once you get SBIR funding, um, you're able to, to use it to really grow and scale your business by moving that technology closer to commercialization, things like that. Um, another thing to think about is solving that technical challenge um, through your innovation or technology allows you to look at other other issues, other things. So for example, can the product or innovation be made better by doing X, Y, Z? Um, can you cut costs by doing X, Y, Z? Things like that. So um, it's, it's really beneficial to the small business for um, a number of reasons. A couple of reasons why this program is so great. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why. These are some of the top reasons why. Um, number one, it's equity free investment. You don't have to pay it back. Um, you're not taking out any debt to, to do, you know, to do the research, things like that. So um, non dilutive funding is, is great for small businesses. Uh, number two, it allows you to demonstrate the feasibility of your idea. So again, you have those funds to um, demonstrate and validate your, your innovation. It also allows you to start building a team and building your company for success. So you can use those funds to hire people um, to start scaling your business. Um, it can help you provide due diligence for follow on funding. Um, if you have questions about that, you can reach out later. Happy to talk to you more about that. It also allows you to map your product and value proposition um, to your intended customer. And what we've been seeing in the past couple of years compared to um, you know, five to 10 years ago is much more focus on um, the customer, on the market, on commercialization um, in that phase one. And we'll talk about the different phases of these programs, but um, agencies are more and more interested in, do you know what your commercialization plan is going to be? Do you have an idea of who your market is? Things like that. And they want to know that before they fund you. So that didn't used to be um, as important in the phase one before, but now, now it is. So it's really important to think about that. And then it also reduces your need to self-fund your R&D. So again, really big um, R&D funding is expensive. <laughs> um, and so the, these funds are again there to support that um, early stage R&D. So why does the government care and why why do they have these set asides for for this these programs um they they are, they're very interested in building a, a stronger economy for for america for the us um the more small businesses that succeed that that equals more tax revenue more job growth um more economic impact etc um and small businesses account for 44 percent of us economic activity so they're really interested in supporting um those small businesses it also helps to build a stronger innovation pipeline. So um, looking at stats, small businesses produce 16 times more patents per employee than large businesses. So they're doing a lot more research, turning, turning out a lot more innovations and technologies. Um, they also employ almost 40% of America's scientists and engineers. 
Um, and small businesses are typically a lot more flexible and mobile than larger companies. So they can react um, a lot faster and produce things sometimes a lot quicker. Um, obviously they aren't as, um, don't have access to as many resources, but again, that's where the SBI program comes in to provide that, that capital. Um, so some of the differences, again, between the two programs, we often call them sister programs. They're very, very similar. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the specific differences, but um, in general, SBIR, and actually this is true for SB STTR too, they both support R&D and financing of innovative technologies. For SBIR, it's approximately a $3.2 billion annual set aside um, across the 12 different participating agencies. And the way they calculate how much gets set, gets set aside is it's 3.2% of the extramural R&D budget for all agencies with a budget greater than 100 million per year. So that means that there's some um, flexibility there. If an agency's budget falls below that 100 million mark, they don't have to participate in the programs anymore. If an agency that isn't participating now um, has a budget that um, meets or exceeds that 100 million mark, um, they will then be participating in these programs. The STTR program, um, the biggest difference, and we'll talk about, again about this in a little bit, but it's designed to facilitate that cooperative R&D between the small businesses and research institutions. Research institutions are um, institutions like national labs, so Sandia, LANL, um, universities, um, things like that. So there is a requirement that you have to partner with one of them for an STTR, whereas SB, SBIR, there isn't that requirement. For STTR, it is 0.45% um, of the extramural research budget for agencies with a budget greater than 1 billion per year. So it's a smaller program. There's less agencies that participate because of those um, budget requirements. And that, that usually translates to about a $450 million set aside per year. So some more um, differences between the two programs. And again, we'll be sending out these slides so you can look at them um, in more detail later. But the partnering requirement, so SBIR, you can partner with a research institution, but you're not required to. STTR, you are required to. Um, for the principal invest investigator, for SBIR, their employment has to be over 50% with the small business. Um, with STTR, the PI can be employed by either the research institution partner or the small business. So that's pretty significant. Uh, for the work requirement in SBIR, you can outsource up to 33%. So that's for subbing with contractors, with research institutions, things like that. And then that goes a little bit up in a phase two to 50%. Um, again, with STTR, you have that requirement. The minimum for that is 40%. Um, to the small business and 30% to the research institution partner. So you can see they're very similar in percentages. Um, the only difference is they are, it's a requirement with STTR. For IP, um, this is one we get a lot of questions on. For SBIR, um, you don't need to have a formal IP requirement because you're not required to partner with a, an institution. But with STTR, you do need to have that because you will have that. Um, partnership with, an, with a research institution. It also has to be signed prior to the award. So we always encourage um, clients who are interested in, in applying to STTR to get that going right away and we can help facilitate that um, so that there's no issues with, um, with that agreement. The participating agencies for SBIR, there's 11, there's actually 12, there's 11 agencies and then under one agency, there's two departments. So, so there's 12 different SBIR programs it can be a little bit confusing. Um, and then for STTR, there's only five. And again, that's because that um, extramural R&D budget is so much higher um, compared to SBIR. And then the program size in FY19, again, SBIR was about 3.2 billion. Um, whereas STTR was about 453 million. Um, another question we get asked pretty often um, about the two programs is the competitiveness of, of SBIR versus STTR. STTR tends to be much less competitive in terms of proposal um, proposals because less people 
participate, less small businesses um, apply to that. And that's because again, there's a little more that goes into these with the, um, the IP agreements, with partnering with that institution, things like that. Um, but both programs are still pretty competitive. So the participating agencies, uh, the red, actually all of these participate in SBIR and then the gray, um, the gray boxes are the STTR agency. So you've got USDA Department of Commerce is that agency that's got the two underneath it. So that's NIST and NOAA under DOC. Department of Defense is the biggest um, agency that participates. Uh, Department of Education, Department of Energy, HHS. HHS is a little bit confusing because we often associate NIH with um, HHS. HHS is actually much broader than just NIH. There's the CDC, the FDA. There's a lot of different organizations under HHS, um, but NIH is the largest um, out of those and the most, you know, the most recognizable. Um, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Transportation, the EPA, NASA, and NSF. And then you can see again the gray ones are your STTR participating agencies. Um, Dana. Yes. Uh, relevant to that slide you just had up, uh, someone asked in the chat um, if HUD falls under any of these uh, 11 agencies, and if not, do we know if they'll ever participate in SBIR programs? So I don't think they do participate, and the only way they would is, again, if they reach that R&D budget of over um, $100 million. But I can double check, but I don't, I don't think they do. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephanie, for letting me know. Um, okay, so I am not going to read through these because we will be sending you the slides, but we thought um, this would be useful information for you to have just as a reference for the primary things that um, you can expect to see under these agencies. One of the things we do um, tell our clients a lot, and, and this comes up quite a bit, is you may have an innovation, say it's something health related. And so you say, okay, well, I, I obviously fall under HHS or NIH. Um, what we encourage our clients to do, and we, we help with this, and, and we'll get to that a little bit later when we talk about our FAST program, but just because you're a shoe-in for a particular agency doesn't mean that precludes you from being eligible for other agencies, right? And so if you have a health-related um, say device or innovation, you could also apply under NSF, under DOD. DOD is probably the most um, confusing in terms of when you think of DOD, you think of the warfighter, right, and weapons, things like that. But um, they have to support a, a military. They support carriers, which are basically cities on the water, right? And so there's a lot of different pieces that fit under DOD that you wouldn't normally think of if you're just thinking, oh, warfighter weapons, things like that. And so um, we really encourage you to look at all of the different agencies and see if you fit under, you know, just one or multiple. And usually we can fit um, an innovation under multiple agencies. Some similarities and differences between SBIR and STTR. Um, or between the two, the, between the different agencies, so between the 12 similarities, they all require um, broad SBIR, STTR eligibility, and we'll get to that in another slide. Um, they all have phase one and phase two. We'll also get to that in another slide. Um, they all require some level of technical writing or grant writing. Um, you, you will have to submit a proposal for all of them. They will all have budget requirements, things like that. And then you must solve a technical challenge with your innovation. So it needs to be innovative and it must have commercial potential for them to, to fund it. Some of the differences, the funding mechanism um, will differ. So some are grants, some are contracts, some are both. Uh, the funding levels differ. We'll get to the funding levels here in a, in a slide coming up as well. The proposal package contents and requirements will be different. And this is probably the most important one. Um, every single agency has different 
proposal requirements. It's really confusing. And then again, that's why we're here <laughs> to kind of help you navigate all of those different requirements. And then to make it even more confusing as if it wasn't already confusing enough, um, under specific agencies, so under say DOD, um, you have the Air Force, you've got the Army, the Navy, all of those different service components, they all have their own requirements and um, ways they want that proposal submitted. And so um, again, we're here to help you navigate that entire process. Really important to, to look at that solicitation and see what it is they, that they're asking for because it's not going to be the same across um, all the different agencies. The funding windows are all different for all, all 12 agencies. Um, and then the ability to talk to program managers and directors also differs um, between all of them. So some things to keep in, in consideration if you're going to apply. Uh, some more, I think I went over a bunch of these. Some additional, additional ones, the period of performance for your actual project will differ um, based on, on the agency. Um, the solicitations per year vary. So um, some of the agencies only have one solicitation or, or open period per year, um, but others have up to four. So it really depends. Again, you have to look at, okay, what agency am I interested in and when are they open and closed um, and accepting proposals. Uh, the registration requirements vary. We'll talk about registrations here in a little bit. Um, and again, the funding vehicle, if they're grant-based or contract-based, that'll, that'll vary as well. Um, so to kind of go back, and actually I should have put the slide sooner, <laughs> but um, why, why go after this funding? Um, the government's investing in, a, in an idea, and you won't find many other organizations or um, funds that will invest in an idea that early, right? They want to see some traction and some validation before they put money into it. So um, with SBIR and STTR, they're really, they're funding you at the idea stage, which is great. Uh, the non-diluted funding is free dollars. It's not a loan. You don't have to pay it back. They're not going to um, take any equity in your company, which is really great. Um, it is similar to the established process of seeking third party investment. So um, some of the changes, the more recent changes with SBIR is putting together a pitch um, and you, you have to know your product, your market, how it's going to be sold, things like that. And then one of the big things, if you are interested in like DOD, um, it puts you in a priority position for sole source sales to government during that phase three. So getting that phase one and phase two will, will um, put you in that position, which is really, really great for small businesses. It can often be really difficult to get that without SBIR funding. Um, so we talked about the different vehicles and mechanisms for the awards, um, grants and contracts, right? And we just wanted to bring them up because there's some pretty critical differences between the two that you'll want to be aware of before you apply. So granting agencies and grants have less specific topics. They're usually more interested in, in broader ideas that fit within their priorities, but they're not looking for a specific solution um, to a problem, whereas contracting agencies are very, very focused. I mean, they're super, super focused. Um, again, using the example of DOD, they, they will have topics saying, you know, we need um, this specific um, material or equipment or whatever that solves this problem that we have on carriers. Um, so they, they identify problems that they have within their agency, and then those become the topics. And if you don't fit within that topic, you, you won't get funded. So really important between those two. Grants are a lot more flexible um, because they're, they're designed to provide funds to support a public purpose, whereas contracts are a binding agreement between a buyer and seller for goods or services. So um, contracts are, again, are going to be a lot more specific and detail oriented because you are providing something that, um, you know, they, they were, they specifically requested that you need to deliver on. Um, with grants, the PI has a lot more freedom in defining the scope of work. 
Um, whereas contracts, again, because they tell you what they want, it's, it's a lot more inflexible um, with those agencies. Grants, you have a lot more flexibility in funds. Contracts, uh, your payments are going to be based on your deliverables and milestones, uh, and you'll have a lot more fiscal requirements tied to those. For grants, they require best efforts in research, while contracts require, again, that delivery of those promised goods or services, um, again, determined by your contract. Q&A, Q so questions and answers about the solicitation are not made public for grants. Contracts, they will be made public, again, using the DOD example. And then finally, with grants, um, you get to define the scope of work with grants a lot more broadly, whereas contracts, again, they're going to <laughs> they will define the scope um, since they, they have something very specific in mind. So who, who participates in what? in, in what for, um, for the agencies. Um, contracts are on the left. You've got DOD, NASA, DOC, DHS, DOT, and EPA. Um, the only agency that participates in both is HHS. And then on the granting side, you've got NSF, DOE, USDA, and IES, which is the Department of Education. This table, again, I'm not gonna <laughs> read through every line. It's more for your reference after, um, but this just shows the phase one and phase two award amounts and period um, of performance that you can expect. And um, this, <laughs> this changes quite often. We try to keep it updated as much as possible as soon as solicitations come out. Um, but you can see phase ones vary from about 100K all the way up to 250K whereas phase twos are much higher, starting around 400K, going all the way up to like 1.6 million. So um, those are a lot more. Uh, yes, Steph? Yes, um, so one of the questions in the chat is other than um, DOE, are there any other agencies that have uh, phase zeros? And if so, is there like a list somewhere? Sure, so the, the phase zero program is basically we do we have a phase zero program at, for NMFAS. Phase zero is not an actual phase. Um, it's just a term that that some agencies and some organizations use to describe um, like pre proposal support. So um, DOE has a very structured phase zero program. Some of the other agencies, I know NIH has something similar. Um, DOD has something similar, but not, not nearly as structured. They just have resources and things like that. Um, but we do through NMFAS have what we would consider a phase zero program where we take you through the proposal process, um, things like that to get you prepared to, to submit. Um, but we can come up with a list and send that out in the email too of the more formal phase zero programs that the agencies provide. Okay, and speaking of phases, <laughs> um, SBIR and STTR is what we call a gated program. So there are three um, very distinct phases um, for, for these programs. Phase one is going to be your concept or idea development. Again, um, going back to those uh, phase one funding levels, usually about 100K to 250K over six to 12 months. Um, phase ones typically have about a 15% success rate of submission. And this is talking about SBIR, not STTR. STTR is a little bit higher. Phase two. So one of the, the critical things um, about the gated process is you must have a phase one to get to a phase two. In some circumstances with some agencies, this is rare, but there are some direct to phase twos available. Um, but those are, again, pretty rare um, to find those, and they're usually with NIH. Um, your phase two is going to be your prototype development. Um, because of that, the, the funding level and the period of performance are higher. So you're usually looking, again, about 400 thousand to about 1.5 million for those depending on the agency and then usually around two years or about 24 months. Um, the success rate is much higher on a phase two because you have to have had that phase one 
to go to the phase two. So that's why that success rate is much higher. And then phase three, the important thing about phase three is it is not SBI or funded. So the federal, the, the agencies are not providing funding for your phase three. This is really your commercialization phase. Um, so there's limited direct funding. There is in some circumstances. So if your end customer is, for example, the DOD, DOD could fund you in a phase three, but it would not be through their SBIR program. That makes sense. Okay, so the really the backbone of these programs are, are two things, innovation and commercialization. Um, one thing that we like to mention is innovation does not always mean high tech. Right. So um, some of there's some low tech processes and or products that are considered innovative. Um, one of the examples is comic books for PTSD patients. So, 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 there we go. Um, Innovation also comes in all shapes and forms. So depending on what you're doing, if it's innovative, again, it doesn't have to be what we traditionally consider high tech. Um, and it can also start anywhere in the product or idea chain. Commercialization, again, like I said, is, is um, being prioritized more and more with the federal agencies. Um, commercial merit is, is one of the founding principles of these programs. Um, and what's important to remember is your innovation should have the potential to be commercializable. Um, you don't have to define, and they, they don't define how it needs to be commercialized, and you don't need to have exact um, information on how you would do that when you're applying for your phase one. But you should know that, yeah, this, is, this has potential to be commercializable. I have an idea of what my market looks like. I've looked into this, um, things like that. Oops. Let's see. So some key questions that, that can help you establish commercial viability. Um, what is the demand for, for your product or innovation? And how has it been validated? Do people need this product or service that you're, that you're um, working on? What's the market size? How many people will buy this to satisfy a specific need? Uh, what are the involved economic factors? So um, is what your creating is that a is it a luxury or a necessity things like that um can you reliably reach your customer once you get to that stage uh what's the market saturation what does the competitive landscape look like and how big are the other players and then what is the acceptable price how much will people pay for the solution again it's going to really vary based on what you're working on but these are things that you just want to kind of have in the back of your head as you're um approaching these these solicitations and proposals because you will need to address some of these these things so going into the actual proposal process the first thing you need to do is determine if you're eligible for these programs um, so do you qualify as a small business um, the sba definition is less than 500 employees you must be a for-profit business that is primarily U.S. owned and the work must be done in the U.S. Um, the PI also needs to be employed by the small business, although again, there's some uh, flexibility with that um, with STTR. You also need to have an innovative idea that you want to develop. That's kind of the backbone again. So do you have an idea or technology that can respond to a specific need? that um, the agency has. After you determine those things, so you say, okay, hey, I'm, I'm eligible. I've got an innovation or technology that, that fits this program. And again, we can help you answer those questions. You'll need to complete a bunch of registrations. And so um, we've got a lot of materials um, and resources on exactly how to um, complete these registrations. We also encourage you to reach out to your local PTAC office. And um, if you don't know them, we're happy to provide an introduction if you want more hands-on assistance. Um, but you need your DUNS number, your SAM, an SBA company registration. And then for every agency, they often have specific registrations that they want um, in addition to the, the first three. The next Big step um, after you've done all those is 
determine your topic fit. So review that solicitation for the agency priority, uh, the problems that need to be addressed and see if what you're doing fits within what they want. Um, again, this, this can be a lot broader if you're applying to an agency like NSF um, versus a contracting agency like DOD. Once you move on to the actual proposal package uh, creation process, again, it differs a lot based on the agency. And now some of them require project pitches before you can even apply. Some agencies like the DOE require a letter of intent. So again, it's really important to figure out what the exact requirements are for the particular agency you're interested in um, before you, you start this process. But uh, you can expect to see a cover page, a cost proposal, and a tech technical proposal with all of the agencies. They'll just look a lot different. Uh, before you submit, we always recommend having your proposal reviewed. So secure a third-party reviewer to look through the entire package. We provide reviews free of charge through our program, and then we also have microgrants available um, if you want an additional review with with a professional reviewer. So we always encourage that. The caveat with reviews is you need to finish um, putting together your proposal package um, well in advance of the deadline so that we or whoever is reviewing has sufficient time to review and provide you feedback. And then, so you have time to um, implement that feedback into your proposal. After that, you'll submit. Um, obviously, don't wait to the last minute. We always recommend that. It's never, it's never ended well. <laughs> um, a lot of the, the platforms that these agencies use for submission glitch like the day of. Um, either too many people are trying to submit at the same time or inevitably something will happen and they don't really care um, if it's a, even if it's a glitch on their end. If you don't get it in, get it in in time, it's, you, you know, you don't get it in. They're not going to look at it. So we always recommend submitting at least one day before it's due. So if issues do come up, um, you have time to, to mitigate those. Um, so after you get it all submitted, then you wait. Um, award notification can take anywhere from three to six months, depending again on the agency. Um, and it's, it's um, not a fun waiting game, but, but um, usually, but you know, by, by six months, you'll have heard back either way. So going into FAST at Arrowhead and what we what we provide in terms of SBIR support. Um, again, I'm not going to read this whole slide. It's more there for your information. But we are the, uh, so it's New Mexico Federal and State Technology Partnership Program. We've been funded by the SBA for six years, and then we just got our funding renewed. So we'll be going into our seventh year um, in October of this year. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we started really small. When we started, there was no SBIR support program or a dedicated SBIR support program in the state of New Mexico. Um, and so we've really grown as a program since then from about 38 clients in year one to over 250 now. We offer small businesses a lot of different forms of assistance. And um, let me preface this by saying all of our assistance is free. Um, we make sure we get external funding so that we can provide all of our support for free for small businesses. Um, so we do everything from proposal development assistance. So one-on-one -on -one work with um, our team and, and small businesses on that proposal. We do, again, the reviews. Micro grants um, are available to help with proposal development for conference travel, for reviews, um, anything really tied to putting that proposal package together. We hold a lot of free workshops and engagement events um, throughout the state. Obviously, since COVID hit, we've been doing um, solely virtual <laughs> events and workshops. We hope to start um, doing our in-person workshops and things again maybe this fall, but definitely next spring. We've developed a really, really robust library of tools and resources for SBIR. Um, those are available on our website for free, um, so you can access them at the link uh, provided here. 
Um, and we also have a video series that I think we have over 200 videos now on just about everything to do with, with SBIR. So those are also a really great resource. Um, if you're interested again in, um, in the process and upcoming things, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Um, we send it out every month and it has all of the upcoming um, solicitations, the deadlines, SBIR events, uh, things like that. One of the things we offer, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in another slide, is our accelerators. We developed these about two or three years ago um, when we saw a need for a lot more focused um, proposal development assistance throughout the entire process. So those are multi-week cohorts um, that will get you from, we say from registration to submission. So it's very intense, but you will submit a proposal at the end. And then one of the, the newer things that we're working on is Canvas integration. So Canvas is a learning management system. And we really wanted to get um, more robust curriculum online um, that uh, small businesses can access on their own time. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not like being in, a, in a, an accelerator or something like that. You can just go through the modules at your own pace. Um, and we hope to have all 12 agencies built out in that in the next um, year or two. Uh, so our living library, I won't go too much into this. This, but again, this is that library I was re referencing in the last slide. So we've got tons of um, proposal development templates, things like that. Stephanie, um, every time a solicitation that comes out, Stephanie is mining that solicitation, and updating our compliance matrices, our templates, things like that. And so you have the most up to date information for each agency. Uh, we have a solicitation guide, which you can see on the right hand side. This was put together um, as a really high level reference so that if you think you're interested in a particular agency or agencies, you can kind of see when they open and when they close so that you can um, plan a little bit better for putting those proposal packages together. Um, next slide. Uh, again, our YouTube channel. Um, we have, okay, 141, that needs to be updated. It's, it's over 200 now. <laughs> I, I remember because I just wrote that in a proposal, but um, lots and lots of videos. I, it, one of the things I always um, warn people is if you're trying to fall asleep, these are also great videos to lull you to sleep because they are dry, but we try to keep them really short and sweet so that they have very specific information. And the reason why we created these is a lot of um, our clients, and we know from personal experience too, we're up at you know midnight to 3 a.m. in the morning. There's not another human you can really talk to to ask questions. And so we wanted to have a resource available that um, businesses could access in the wee hours of the night when uh, we aren't we aren't available to answer any questions. So we're always continually adding to our our video library, um, and again, lots of useful videos on there. This is just a very very high level um, snapshot of what assistance could look like um, if you um, become an NFS client. Again, I, I want to preface this by saying it really depends on the agency. It depends on if you're a first time applicant. There's a lot of different factors involved, but we wanted to have something visual to show new applicants all of the different pieces that go into a proposal package. So it's not just writing that technical narrative. It's, it's um, figuring out what you're going to propose, how it fits within the the agency, um, where do your where does your budget fit in? The forms. There's so many forms you have to fill out. Um, all of those different things, um, and so this is kind of what you can expect. And again, it de it depends. We customize our assistance for every single client. So based on your needs, based on um, again where you're at, we will come up with a customized plan um, specific to you. The um, accelerator that I mentioned, so we created this again because we saw a need for more focused support. So 
our, we, we run two different types of accelerators. We have 101, like SBI 101 accelerators and then agency focused accelerators. Our 101 accelerators are pretty broad. They're just introducing you to the programs, things like that. They're usually about five weeks long. Um, by the end of our 101 accelerators, we like participants to have an idea of A, should I apply to these programs? Is my innovation a fit? Things like that. And then B, um, if, if it is a fit, what agency would be most appropriate to apply to? So we want you to have a plan of attack either way um, by the time you finish those accelerators. For our agency focused accelerators, these are much, much more in depth. Um, they, they require quite a commitment by the small business. If you're gonna to put together a proposal package, you're committing that time anyway. And so these are kind of um, designed to support you through that process. But these are usually 12 weeks long. So they're, they're pretty long, but you can come in and not even have your registrations and we'll get you through the registration process and then walk you through every step of putting that proposal package together. And then at the end, we actually, um, set up a Zoom meeting and we will be there over your shoulder while you submit that proposal. And the reason we do that is because, like I said earlier, often there are technical glitches, there may be questions that come up with the, the submission portal, things like that. So we can be there to um, help you through that entire process. So in summary, our program, we, we assist um, in just about everything to do with your proposal creation process. The only thing we will not do is write the proposal for you. Um, we always say that it's, it's critical that you as the owner of that technology, you, you know, you created it, you know it, nobody's gonna know it better than you. Um, you need to be the one to write it. We can never um, explain it as well as you. So we do not write it, but we will help you scope. We will help you with the budget. We'll help you with all of those other pieces um, as you're putting it together. Um, again, we've got lots of resources. We provide review. We have um, funding available to, to help you as you're putting together the proposal, things like that. So um, really great resource if you're a New Mexico business um, that I encourage you to take advantage of. Um, last thing I want to mention is one of the, the big events we do every year. It's called our SBIR STTR Innovation Summit. Um, we do have it scheduled for December 15th from 8.30 to 4.30 Mountain Time. It's going to be virtual again this year. We were kind of going back and forth on whether to um, be in person, do hybrid, or, or do all virtual. But um, given the um, Delta variant and the... Uh, just not knowing what could happen, um, we decided to go all virtual so that we don't have to, um, you know, switch everything over at the last minute. So what we provide with this summit is a really full day of panels, presentations, um, things like that. The most valuable though, and, and if you're thinking about putting together a proposal or applying to one of these agencies is we'll have federal program managers from um, multiple programs there to talk to you. So you can schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions with them to talk about your innovation, to ask any questions that are agency specific, um, that they will be there to um, help. So we'll have that all scheduled for December 15th. It is free. Um, we are getting the registration platform um, together right now, so we'll be sure to let everybody know once it goes live. Um, but again, if you're available that day, I highly encourage you to attend because it'll be um, a day full of lots of information and then again, access to those program managers. And that's it. So if anybody has any questions, um, let me know. And I will also drop my information in the chat as well. We'll send out the slides. Let me see. Um, and Dana, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, okay. So yeah. what, the first one is, uh, do the 11 agencies have data rights? Do, does each agency have data rights? Da so it depends. Yes, I can talk to to you more if you want to email me um on that we can we can discuss that in more depth but yeah there are data rights uh tied to all of them 
And that's actually Stephanie, I can see them now. Um, so once you are awarded a phase one is the innovator responsible for selecting an incubator to help with the product? No, so you, you are responsible for um, finding the facilities or having the facilities to build that out. And if you don't have the facilities, this is when an STTR is more advantageous because you can partner with say a national lab or a university, um, an organization who does have those facilities to, to do that portion of the work. Um, where do you find agency SBIR STTR proposals? So I'm assuming you're talking about solicitations and not the proposals. One of the, one of the biggest gaps um, that again, that we've identified, and we're working on this right now. I think we're one of the only programs in the country working on this, but we get asked all the time, like all the time, if there are like dummy proposals or proposals that were funded that um, people can look at to see what was successful in terms of, of that proposal submission, that, that data is not readily available. Those proposals aren't. Um, there are some agencies, I think DOD has some on their website that are old and they're not very good. So one of the things we're working on at FAST is actually creating dummy proposals for, um, for some of the agencies that'll have, we'll, we'll put together a complete proposal package so you can see what the different components actually look like on paper um, that contribute to a successful proposal. Um, for solicitations, if you're looking for solicitations, we can help you find those. Um, the best thing to do is to go to each agency's website. SBIR.gov also is a great place to start. They've got information on all of the agencies. Um, my only critique on that is sometimes they're a little bit slow in updating their links. So if you know, like you want to apply to DOE, my, my recommendation would be go straight to DOE's website or sign up for our newsletter um, because we are notified by the agencies as soon as um, those solicitations open and we include that and blast that out to all of our, our newsletter followers. Um, let's see other, do agencies do webinars on their upcoming topics? Yes, they do. Um, and so that's another reason, again, to sign up for a newsletter. We include all of the upcoming webinars. And then also, if you have social media, um, Stephanie is amazing at posting. As soon as a, an agency has an upcoming webinar, she posts about it on our, on our Facebook. Um, and we have a Twitter account, I believe, as well. And so you can um, find that there. And we, we try to make sure we post that as soon as the agency lets us know so that you um, have time to sign up for those. The DOD research labs issue their own topics. So yes, within DOD, that well, the service components issue their own topics. So within the Army, within the Navy, and then like if you go to the Navy, there's NAVC, NAVAIR. I mean, there's there's more components under those. So they will all issue their own um, their own topics. And again, this is another reason if you're interested in DOD um, to attend our December event because if that our, that event originally started as a DOD only event and then we broadened it to other agencies but we do dedicate time in the afternoon to go over the um, newly released DOD topics so if you're interested in that there'll be um, program managers from DOD there who can talk to you about about the specific topics um all right any more questions you're also welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like um but if that is it, again, we recorded this, so we'll have this up on our um, YouTube channel. Feel free to reach out to me, happy to answer any questions. Uh, oh, I see another question. How can we get a list of participants? Okay, so uh, for the STTR, if they are a major research institution, they can participate. There's no, um, I don't, there's not really a list of participating universities, most research, University. So for New Mexico, for example, New Mexico State, New Mexico Tech, and UNM all participate in that program. Um, but the big thing would be to reach out if you have a university in mind to make sure. And again, 
we're happy to help facilitate those conversations if you're interested in STTR. And we have some STTR, a lot of STTR specific resources as well, um, if that's something you're interested in, because again, it does, there are a few more steps and, and things you need to consider if you are going to apply to that program. Okay. All right, so yeah, look, um, keep an eye out in your inbox for our follow-up email. We'll be sending all of that out. Um, and thank you again for attending today. Again, reach out if you have any questions and um, we're, we're excited to um, get people excited about SBIR. That's kind of our bread and butter, we love it. So <laughs> the more we can promote it, the better and the more we can um, make it less confusing, the better. So uh, thank you again, and we'll talk to everybody later. Bye.